Hey there! Today, I'll be giving you some tips for completing the Monarch's Journey challenges for Lao Hongji. I probably butchered his name, but let's keep going. I recorded the gameplay you're seeing using only the DLCs that have been made available for free, those being the Sword of Islam, the Old Gods, Sons of Abraham, the Reapers Do, and most recently, Horse Lords. Horse Lords is mandatory for playing this challenge, but besides that one, the tips I'm giving should be universal no matter which DLCs you own. If you're wondering why my game looks different than yours, I'm running some cosmetic and quality of life mods that don't interfere with unlocking the challenges. Check the description for those, and if you want to get the Old Gods DLC for free. There are a couple of rules I suggest double-checking before you start this challenge. First, set the Mongol invasion to historical to give yourself 150 years before they show up, because if Genghis Khan spawns in Mongolia while you're still trying to progress toward these challenges, your run is probably going to be ruined. Set Nomad Stability to Stable to help hold your realm together and prevent vassals from splitting off when your characters die. If you're playing with Jade Dragon, you might also want to set China to not launch major invasions, which will help lessen a huge threat that's going to be on your borders for the entire game. And with that, let's get started. All three of these challenges can be completed as long as your game continues, so you don't need to rush to finish any with Hongji himself. The first challenge is Lavish Spending. Have as many Buddhist-owned temples in your realm as possible. 4 for bronze, 8 for silver, and 12 for gold. Second is Landmass. As a nomad, have as many counties in your realm as possible. 100 for bronze, 150 for silver, and 200 for gold. Finally, Clanky. Have as many clans in your realm with an opinion of 60 or higher of your clan as possible. 2 for bronze, 3 for silver, and 4 for gold. So these challenges don't really require anything out of the ordinary besides normal Nomad gameplay, but because the Horse Lords DLC might be new to some people and Nomad mechanics are so different from feudal ones, I felt like part of this guide should be dedicated to just explaining how to play a Nomad in general. I'm not going to go fully into all the mechanics, just to try to give some guidance on what you should be doing to gain power. Skip to the number on the screen if you just want to go to the challenge tips. So nomads are encouraged to not have castles and baronies like other government types do. They have a single capital with lots of potential buildings, all of which travel with the capital if its location is ever changed. Everything else in a nomad's territory is empty grassland for grazing. The more of those you have, the higher your potential population. Your population fills up to its maximum over time and is used to fill your manpower, another nomad exclusive resource that determines the size of your horde. Since you don't have any castles or places to train peasant levies, your Nomad Horde is your main personal fighting force. It works a lot like retinues from the Legacy of Rome DLC. You buy a unit with prestige, gold, or piety, it starts with a small number of soldiers and reinforces up to its full strength over time by burning more of that same resource, and in the case of Nomads it also requires manpower. So empty grassland means more population, which means more manpower, which means more hordes, which means more soldiers. Cool. Nomads use an entirely different set of war declaration methods to other realms. Conquests let you take one county from a neighbor, subordinations let you force a duchy to become your vassal, invasions let you take an entire kingdom for yourself, plus any territory you were occupying that was inside the same ruler's realm, but outside of the target kingdom of the war. And subjugation is a once-per-lifetime war that lets you vassalize an entire realm regardless of its size. These are just as absolutely overpowered as they sound, but the trade-off is that the more powerful options require you to have a certain size population. Subordinations require your current population to be over half of its potential maximum, and at least 5,000 if the guy you're declaring against is a tribal ruler, and 15,000 if he's not nomadic or tribal. And invasions require you to have at least 30,000 population, and your current population needs to be 75% of its max. They also require spending prestige, which is extremely important for nomads because of... The clan screen. It shows information about your clan and the clans of all the nomad vassals in your realm, including population, number of counties, and most importantly, clan sentiment. On top of the ruling vassals in your realm having their own personal opinions of you, the invisible council of elders in each clan also have opinions of every other clan in the realm, including yours. The sentiment a vassal's clan has toward you directly translates as an increase or decrease to the vassal's personal opinion, and can be the difference between a loyal Khan and one who wants to overthrow you and cut your head off. So it's in your best interest to keep the clans happy. There are many factors that give small bonuses to clan sentiment, like putting the clan's leader on your council and being the same religion as them, but the main things they care about are your prestige and how fairly they feel they're being dealt out land in the realm. Even if you're on a roll and want to expand quickly, you should always consider holding on to some prestige and not spending it on war so you can keep the respect of the clans while you wait to generate more. Let's say you win a war. If you are fighting another nomad, chances are all their counties are going to be nomad counties, classified as counties that have only one constructed building or none at all. 
Nomad counties are your bread and butter as far as generating more population goes, and the clans expect to get a cut of them seeing as their contributions help you win all those wars. Whenever you see this mountain pop up at the top of your screen, you need to give out a certain number of nomad counties to the clans. Doesn't matter which counties or who you give them to. The three things to keep in mind when handing out grazing land are A. Making sure you're holding on to the best counties for yourself, meaning the ones that have the most holding slots in them. B. Making sure each clan is roughly equal in max population, and therefore roughly equal in power. Creating new clans by right-clicking your own portrait and splitting off a clan that you set up in one of your own counties is often a better choice than giving out excess land to your existing cons. Having nine equally powerful clans means that one or two of them getting upset won't be able to raise a significant force to rebel. And C. Make your nomad vassals spread out like a patchwork in your realm, not large, uninterrupted chunks of land. Allowing the clans to have big, connected realms like this looks a lot nicer, but it also allows them to create duchies and even kingdoms once they have enough land that's all in the same geographic location. Owning duchies and kingdoms gives them additional passive prestige generation. Why don't you want your nomad vassals to have prestige? Because of Nomad Succession Law, which normally keeps the Kaganate within the same dynasty, with the throne going to the current Khan's most prestigious adult son or brother. But Nomad vassals with a lot of prestige and a population larger than the Kagans can sneak into succession as well, causing your family to lose control of the realm and becoming a vassal upon inheritance. In addition, Nomad vassals who have more prestige than the next heir will gain weak claims on the Kaganate when the heir inherits, which they can't push under normal circumstances, but it will cause them to have severe opinion penalties of their liege for the rest of their life since they consider themselves more fitting to being on the throne. It's already difficult to make your heir have more prestige than your cons, given that the cons are landowning nobles and also probably older than your heir, and have had a long time to generate prestige, but they also spend it on wars and decisions, and any opportunity you take to deny them creating more titles for themselves and increasing their prestige even more will help your heir keep the clans under control. Counties that have two or more developed baronies aren't considered nomad provinces, and the clans don't care about them. You can hold them yourself, but you don't generate much profit off the baronies you directly hold, and any feudal rulers you vassalize will usually have a pretty bad opinion of you. The trick is that your main nomad clans don't care about tyrannical actions you do against vassals of other government types, so you can unjustly take away all the feudal vassals' titles and burn their buildings to the ground for money and to make more room for empty grassland, which feeds into the resource stream and results in higher population for manpower and to reach the population milestones to perform certain types of wars. The only drawback is that for several years the county you're pillaging turns into a powder keg for peasant revolts because they're kind of annoyed that you're burning and stealing all their stuff. You can pretty much wage war constantly as a nomad as long as you have more troops than your opponent. Your horde regenerates insanely fast if you have the resources and manpower to support it, and even reinforces while in enemy territory. If you get big enough, you don't even need to siege, just assault each barony, even ones you don't outnumber by that much, take significant losses, but just reinforce fast enough to repeat the process for the next barony. And that's only your personal horde. You can raise levies from feudal vassals just like anyone else, and your nomad vassals can be summoned to war like tribal chiefs if they don't hate you. Which is good because it means they're going to provide their full horde to your efforts, but bad because it means you can't directly control them or give them orders to group up with you, functions that are locked behind the Monks and Mystics DLC. If you have Monks and Mystics, great. If you don't, you need to hope and pray that the AI decides that it wants to do anything useful today. At some point in your conquering, you'll find yourself with a lot of money. Spend it on as much heavy cavalry as you can fit into your horde, then on population, manpower, and tax-increasing buildings in your nomad capital. In short, nomads have a lot of weird features, and it can be tough to start as them, but once you snowball into a big population size and a large enough horde or loyal enough vassals, there is absolutely nothing that can stop you except your own incompetence. And with that, on to the challenges. I'm going to start with Clanky because it's by far the easiest one. You need to get four vassal clans to like you, the clans themselves, not the rulers. You conveniently begin with exactly four clans, and all of them hate you because your prestige starts very low. First, wage a humiliation war on the Kyrgyz nomads bordering you to the west. Winning this war won't give you any land, but you'll steal 25% of their population and add it to yours, as well as gain 300 prestige. Immediately spend that prestige by declaring tributary wars on the weak little settled tribes in this northern corridor below Siberia. Siberia. This will, once again, not give you any land, but each tributary war you win gives all your clans a temporary plus 10 opinion bonus of you, and it stacks. So after waging just a handful of these wars against anybody in range who you can win against, all the other clans' sentiment should hit 60 in no time. 
You should also assign your chancellor to the more problematic clan's territory to work on improving their opinion of you, and form a blood oath with the most powerful Khan who will accept it for a boost in their clan's opinion, and a guarantee that they won't refuse your call to war for as long as both of you live. Challenge complete. The lavish spending challenge requires you to have 12 temples in your realm under the ownership of Buddhists. You are a Buddhist yourself at the start, but have no temples in your realm, just grass. You can build them yourself, but why would you do that? The Tibetan desert directly to your south is almost entirely Buddhist controlled and has many temples already built. Establish dominance over them with the help of your Khans and choose whether to burn everything that isn't a temple to the ground for more grass and population at the cost of needing to stomp out constant peasant rebellions, or allow the old nobility to retain their lands if you think you can keep them under control. Use your subordination wars carefully and target locations that have Buddhist temples within them or which will expand the borders of your realms so that you will neighbor a different kingdom and so have access to wars against them. Once you have 12 Buddhist temples in your realm, the lavish spending challenge will be complete. Landmass will take the majority of time in this challenge. 200 counties is a lot of land to take even for a nomad. You should definitely try to shoot for the 30k population benchmark to enable invasion wars, but even with the ability to take an entire realm for yourself in a single war if you play your cards right, you'll need to travel far and wide to get gold in this challenge. Expanding west will give you the best grazing land and population growth as you'll mostly be fighting other nomads over empty provinces, but you'll quickly hit a wall in the form of the Cumans, who have an enormous population and depending on which religion they convert to and which families they marry into, can bring some of the most powerful realms in the game to help defend them. Even invading the Cumans is more trouble than it's worth. Since empty nomad provinces can only be occupied by building a fort in them or leaving troops on them, and you can't build forts being a nomad yourself, you need to leave a portion of your army behind in every single county outside the kingdom you declared the invasion for if you want to keep them after the war ends. At any point if a Cuman army decides to attack the skeleton crews you've set up, your entire formation falls apart and you need to set it up all over again or just accept that you're not getting all the land. Invading large feudal realms like the Ghaznavids, the Seljuks, or the major kingdoms in India is easier because you just need to siege down one holding in each county to secure it as yours after finishing the war. But because nomad invasions are considered holy wars, you need to make sure you can beat not only the realm you're attacking, but any strong rulers of the same religion who might join in to defend them from your horde. By the end of my first successful playthrough, I had an absolutely enormous realm stretching from the Arctic Sea to the Indian Ocean, with my clan's name sprawled out over half the map like a 20-pound cat in a sunbeam. And this disgusting blob of an empire is exactly 200 counties, the bare minimum for the gold challenge. Have fun with that. Remember to keep your nomad vassals happy and balanced in strength, commit liberal amounts of eco-terrorism for that sweet sweet grass, and always name your horse Dragon for good luck. I hope this guide was helpful, thanks for watching as always, and I'll see you next time.